Happy Sabbath, church family. Stu, it's great to be back doing announcements with you. Yeah, it's been you. a while since we've been doing it together, actually. Thanks for letting me back in. Yeah, yes, that one. there. Yeah. Uh, we have a few announcements. Stu's going to start us off. That's right. First off is Rules of Engagement. It happened, the first one happened last night, but you can still sign up. If you're interested, it, we encourage you to sign up as quick as possible. It will be next Friday evening at 6 p.m. in room 128. The annual Oak Glen picnic up at the Oak Glen Schoolhouse is happening October the 12th at 1.30. We invite all of you to come up, bring your friends, bring your families, bring your lunches, and caramel apples and hot chocolate will be provided. There is always great community that takes place. You meet lots of people. It's a great setting, a lot cooler than down the mountain. So we encourage all of you to check it out and go October the 12th. Our next announcement I'm really excited about, the media department is launching a brand new web show or YouTube show called The Bridge. This is where we're trying to bring together the congregation in the pew and all of you that view abroad. And with a church this size, there's so many things going on and all kinds of great experiences. We really want to kind of get backstage or behind the scenes and really see kind of the inner workings of the spiritual activity, what God is doing in this congregation. So we're really excited about it. It starts next Friday evening at 6 p.m. You'll be able to view it on Roku, our website, or on YouTube. It's next Friday evening, The Bridge. We encourage you to check it out. I think that's it for announcements today. Now, I just have to say one thing. We've been doing a really big push to meet all of the guests and have them come out to the Uconnect Center. We have people from all over the world, Stu, that come out there. We've had people from Australia and Norway and Africa and the Philippines, and it has just been a real blessing. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's been a real blessing to meet all of you. So if you are visiting with us today, please come out to the Uconnect Center. We would love to meet you, give you a little gift that we have. And also, we have lots of ways that you can find out um, information on how to get uh, connected with the ministry. So check out your bulletin, our website, our app, and of course you can always talk to someone at the Uconnect Center. That's right. And with Stu is always ready to answer any questions. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and with that, on behalf of everyone that works so hard to make the worship experience and this congregation a meaningful experience, have a wonderful Sabbath day.
Good morning. We want to welcome, welcome you this morning. For those of you who have joined us here in this sanctuary, those of you who have joined us online, welcome to the Loma Linda University Church, and welcome to our church family. This morning, we will be continuing with part three of a nine-part series on the story of Jacob. Now, this story of Jacob has brought so many valuable lessons for us that are actually relevant to our lives. And as we contemplate what Pastor Randy's message will be about today, it is going to remind us of the relentless pursuit of God after us. I wanted to reflect in the Bible on Psalms 139. And if you get a chance, I would love for you to take today or tomorrow and read through the whole chapter because I'm just going to get a little snippet of what the verse is about. This is Psalms 139. When can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the seas, there, even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. Praise God. What an awesome God we have that he wants to pursue us. Be blessed today and happy Sabbath. morning, happy Sabbath church family. Let's sing together.
Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him kneel for prayer. Dear God in heaven, hallowed be thy name in all the earth today. What a privilege it is to come before you in the spirit of holiness and in the joy of religious freedom this morning. Dear Father, we are so grateful for the multitudinous blessings that you have given to us during this past week. 
You have protected us as we have traveled on the highways and the byways and some in the airways, Father. For those who are bereaved, you have been a comforter. For those who have been sick, you have been a healer. For those who have been discouraged, you have been the shoulder on which they can lean on this week. But for all of us, God, you have been the God of forgiveness this week. You said in your word that if we would confess our sins, that you would forgive us and that you would cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And today, each one of us stands in the need of your forgiveness today, dear Father. And we say thank you for this and hallelujah. Dear Father, we are so grateful for this series on the life of, on the life of Jacob that Pastor Randy has brought to us and continues to bring to us, Father. And we pray that as we listen to these messages and as we hear these words and reflect on these messages that we will not think of someone else who may need to hear this, but that we may take a page or a verse from that Negro spiritual which says, it's me, it's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. This is our prayer. In the blessed name of our best friend, Jesus. And everyone said, Amen.
Loma Linda University Church is very committed to outreach, to moving out beyond our borders and our boundaries and making a difference in the communities in which we live and with whom we interact. We have been working to solidify the relationship in a variety of ways, but certainly as it has to do with outreach, with Loma Linda University Health, our neighbors and friends right across the sidewalk from us. One of the projects in which we've been partnering is in San Bernardino, the San Bernardino Community Seventh-day Adventist Church. Some exciting things have been going on in that place with the help of members from Praxis and others here at the University Church. And there is a new endeavor coming up that we would like to open the door so that each of you would have an opportunity to serve. Linda Mendez is one of the faithful workers here at LLUC in UReach, our outreach arm. Linda, I'm delighted to have you here today. So tell us what's going on. October 27, from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., San Bernardino Community Church, along with Hands International, have combined efforts, and they're going to be having a health clinic. We want to invite you guys to come and sign up. They need your help. They need hygienists, nurses, podiatrists. They also need people to help check in the volunteers and check in the clients that are going to be coming to receive medical help. Church, we want to encourage you guys to sign up. You can do so at Uconnect, or you can also do so online. Help us and partner with us in trying to make man whole. So this is a wonderful opportunity for anyone to be involved in some capacity, but in this case, especially if you have training and professionalism in some of the healthcare branches that Linda just named. So again, when is this? October 27. Better say that again. October 27 right. <laughs> from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. at San Bernardino Community Church. In the lobby at the UReach Center, online, you can sign up. We'd love to have you join others here from the Loma Linda University Church and San Bernardino Community Church to make a greater difference in our community. Kiddos, where are you? Come on up, collect that lamb's offering as you come up, okay? All right. Pastor Miguel has something to share with you, and we are going to sing in right, out right, as you come on down. I'm in right, out right, up right, down right, happy all the time. I'm in right, out right, up right, down right, happy all the time. Since Jesus Christ came in, I gave my heart to him. I'm in right up, right up, right down, right happy all the time. You are doing such a great job with those motions. I think it's time we switched them up. You ready to reverse it? We're gonna do out right, in right, down right, up right. You ready? Here we go, let's give it a shot. I'm Right in, right down, right up, right happy all the time. I'm out, right in, right down, right up, right happy all the time. Since Jesus Christ came in, I gave my heart to Him. I'm out, right in, right down, right up, right happy all the time. Come on, kids, let's show them how we do it a little faster. Here we go. I'm out, right, in, right, down, right, up, right, happy all the time. I'm out, right, in, right, down, right, up, right, happy all the time. Since Jesus Christ came in, I gave my heart to him. I'm out, right, in, right, down, right, Right, happy all the time. Amen. Okay, boys and girls, I have a lot of you here today. Now, I need, a I need to ask you a question. You guys ready? Yes. All right, it's a really simple question. Do any of you know somebody that's tricky? You guys don't know any tricky people? You know a tricky person? Who's tricky? 
Your dad is tricky. <laughs> we'll talk to your dad later on. Who else knows a tricky person? Yes, who do you know that's tricky? Your sisters are tricky. How about you? You're tricky. I'm tricky. Yeah, you're my uncle, so I should know. <laughs> who else is tricky? My, jo my cousin Jordan. Okay. Before this devolves, I have another question, and maybe you can answer. Have any of you at some point done something tricky? <gasps> You've done something tricky? What did you do that was tricky? Close your, eye, close your ears, Mom. What did you do that was tricky? I've eaten cookie dough that I had to put in the fridge. You've eaten cookie dough that you haven't put in the fridge. <laughs> that not only is tricky, that is messy. What else? Any of you want to share anything else that you've done tricky? What have you done that's tricky? She doesn't want us to tell that she put gum on the car. <laughs> so, Daddy and Mommy, there's a surprise waiting for you. <laughs> okay, so many tricky things. I think I need to write it with my tricky pen. You see, I have a tricky pen, and the purpose of this pen is to write every single tricky thing that you've done. So, I've got gum, a cookie dough, I've got a dad that's kind of tricky. I've got a bunch of stuff that is tricky, and like that, my pen is gone. Where'd it go? It's in my sleeve. So you guys are magicians because my tricky pen is in my shirt jacket. You guys found it. Awesome. So, do you know that this sermon series is about a man that was really tricky? Do you guys know the name of the man? It starts with a J? Jacob. Jacob. And you see, guys, when you do stuff that's tricky, thanks for taking my jacket there, when you do stuff that's tricky, your relationship with Jesus is really tight. You guys are connected. But then, sometimes, you do stuff that's tricky. And when you do something that's tricky, it's like a black box that comes into your life. You see, sin is this black box. And you know what sin does? It, can, it disconnects you from Jesus. And all of a sudden, this life that was connected and perfect, sin disconnected it. And now it's broken. And then you're sad because you feel like you're separated from Jesus and you're like, what am I going to do? So all you do is connect the black box. And so what you do is you begin to pray. And you pray and you pray and you pray. And when you pray, God takes that life that is disconnected and connects it again. So now I need you to do, me, do two favors for me, okay? Number one, stop putting gum in your car. And number two, when you go back to your seats, make sure that mommy and daddy listen to the story of Jacob as God connected his life back together. Have a great, great time, and God bless you guys. You can go back to your seats now. God answers the mess of life with one word, grace. I am busily engaged in the study of the Bible. I believe it is God's word because it finds me where I am. God will meet you where you are in order to take you where he wants you to go. Christ longs to give those who do not understand him correct views of his character, to set them right, to take away their burden of sin and resistance and give them rest. The Divine Comforter is full of pity, sympathy, and love and seeks to woo them to God. He seeks to direct their attention to Christ as He really is, full of mercy, compassionate, and pardoning love, willing to forgive their transgression and sin when they repent and seek Him for forgiveness. Trying to figure out God is like trying to catch a fish in the Pacific Ocean with an inch of dental floss.
Jacob left Beersheba. He ran, he walked, and maybe even he skipped. And set out for Haran. That's a town in Mesopotamia. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Maybe he was tired, or maybe he was scared of the dark. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and laid down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway that rested on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. Angels were ascending and descending it. They were going up and down and up and down. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and they will spread out. To the west and to the east. To the north and to the south. All people on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I will be with you, and I will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I, I will not, not leave you until, until I have done what I have promised you. How's that for making Scripture live? Amen. Wasn't that beautiful? Love having our kids involved. July 2, 1982. Larry Walters lived just down the road from us, down in Los Angeles. Larry had grown up with the dream of flying. He always wanted to fly. When he got old enough, he tried to join the Air Force, but because of bad eyesight, they turned him down. And thus it seemed that Larry would be doomed to a future of sitting out on the back porch and looking up and watching the jets fly by. But then Larry concocted a plan. I don't know when the plan came about. I don't know if it was when he was sitting in the backyard and looking at that in his words, extremely comfortable lawn chair from Sears. I don't know if that's when it happened, or if it happened at another time, maybe watching the jets streak the sky. But at some point, Larry concocted a plan. His plan took him down to the local Army-Navy surplus store where he bought 45 four-foot-in-diameter weather balloons. Then he drove to another store and bought as many containers as he felt he needed of helium. And then he went home and he took that extremely comfortable lawn chair from Sears. He tied it to his Jeep. And then he tied all these balloons to the chair. He invited his family and his friends together around. He filled the balloons with helium. He sat down in the chair and they strapped him in. And then he took some sandwiches, some liquid courage, and a pellet gun. And he gave the signal to his friends. He said, okay, I'm ready. I'd like to read to you what happened next. These words come from an aptly titled book, The Darwin Awards, as to what happened next. Larry's plan was to sever the anchor and lazily float up to a height of about 30 feet above his backyard where he would enjoy a few hours of flight before coming back down. He figured he would pop a few brews, then pop a few of the 45 balloons when it was time to descend and gradually lose altitude. But things didn't quite work out as Larry had planned. When his friends cut the cord anchoring the lawn chair to his jeep, jeep, he did not lazily float up 30 feet. Instead, he streaked into the L.A. sky as if shot from a cannon, pulled by a lift of 45 helium-filled balloons holding 33 cubic feet of helium each. He didn't level off at 100 feet or 1,000 feet. After climbing and climbing, he leveled off at 16,000 feet. At that height, he couldn't risk shooting any of the balloons, lest he unbalance the load and really find himself in trouble. So he stayed there, 
drifting with his drink and sandwiches for several hours while he considered his options. At one point, he crossed the primary approach to LAX. <laughs> and Delta and TWA airline pilots radioed in incredulous reports of a strange sighting. <laughs> Eventually, he gathered the nerve to shoot a few of the balloons. And slowly, he began to descend in the night sky. The hanging tethers tangled and ca caught in a power line Blacking out Long Beach for 20 minutes. But Larry climbed to safety where he was promptly arrested by, arrested by waiting members of the LAPD. The FAA was not amused. Safety Inspector Neil Savoy says, We know he broke some part of the Federal Aviation Act, and as soon as we can figure out which part it is, charges will be filed. In the end, Larry was fined $4,000, though that was later reduced to $1,500, and he became a motivational speaker. <laughs> <laughs> you too can fly. <laughs> now, as I read Larry's story, there was a question that to me seemed to be the most obvious question to ask. I looked at the different accounts and I couldn't find any answer in what was written. But I am sure that he must have asked himself this question. No doubt. While he was floating there lazily at 16,000 feet, you will not convince me that there wasn't a part of him that said, what in the world got into me? What on earth was I thinking? What did I do? And it's right there with that question, what did I do, that Larry's journey intersects with ours. Because the truth is, you've asked yourself that question. I've asked myself that question. There's a choice we have to make. Some possibility that we consider we make a decision, we set a course, and soon we're disco we discover that was not wise. Wasn't in line with God's plan, wasn't in line with divine wisdom, wasn't even in line with human wisdom. And we end up floating around lazily at 16,000 feet asking, what did I do? How in the world am I going to deal with this? Well, it's right there with that question that our lives and Larry's experience intersects with a biblical figure named Jacob. Because Jacob has every reason at this moment in his life to be asking, what did I do? What on earth was I thinking? His life is at risk. He's running from home. The future is uncertain. He's at 16,000 feet thinking, oh no, now what? So I want to read you the opening to this episode of Jacob's story. Now we're not going to read the whole text right now. We'll come to that in just a few moments. But right now I just want to read you the opening three words. Just three words. From Genesis 28.10. Here is how this episode in his life begins. Jacob left Beersheba. Jacob left Beersheba. Now the sense of the meaning in the original language could be described this way. Jacob was floating around at 16,000 feet saying, what did I do? <laughs> That's the reality. What did I do? Because consider what has happened. It's just happened. He and his mother, she, he was her favorite son, colluded to deceive their aging and blind father and husband to, to, to outmaneuver Esau for the patriarchal blessing. And they succeeded, outmaneuvered Esau. But as soon as that message leaks out, as soon as Esau discovers what has happened, he is breathing out fire, breathing out threats, I'm coming after you. As soon as his mother realizes what's happening, she says to Jacob, you got to get out of Dodge. Go, go, go. That's just happened. 
Now Jacob is, is, is headed toward, well, Jacob left Beersheba. Jacob had to leave Beersheba. Beersheba was a place of history. Abraham had dug a well here, a deep well, searching for that liquid of life so deeply needed by the desert nomads of that day and time and ours. That was Beersheba. It had been a place where Abraham had built an altar. It had been a place where Isaac and Rebekah had lived. A place where Jacob had spent years growing up with his family. It was a place of history, a place of identity. Jacob left Beersheba. What was he headed toward? Well, he was headed toward an uncertain future. Behind him, he was leaving a grieving, heartbroken father. He was leaving a bitter and enraged brother. He was leaving a dearly loved mother whom he would never see again. He was leaving a family rupture that would last for decades. And he was heading toward an uncle that he would soon meet that was the one person that could outmaneuver and outconnive Jacob. In other words, he was going to pay for what happened in deep ways. But some of that is yet future. Jacob left Beersheba. He's running. Feet pounding the path. Heart pounding his chest, furtive glances over his shoulder. Every single person he encounters is a potential threat. Do they know Esau? Has Esau sent them? Will they go tell Esau? Jacob has to hide. He has to hide from Esau. He has to hide from his past. And honestly, he needs to hide from God. Jacob is floating around at 16,000 feet with no way out of this. What have I done? John Ortberg retells a story told by Dallas Willard. Little two-and-a-half-year-old girl. She's out in the backyard playing. Her grandmother, her nana, is sitting there. She's reading or crocheting. And little Larissa has kind of worked her way around behind Grandma, so Grandma can't see. And she's engaged in something that she has just learned how to do. And that is make warm chocolate. It's just mud, but she just now figured out how to do it. She's making warm chocolate to give to her grandmother. Well, when her grandmother realizes, it's like, Oh, what? Oh, all over your... Uh, no, no, no. And her grandmother cleaned it up, cleaned her up and said, Now, no more warm chocolate, please. She's two and a half. So it's just a few moments before Larissa is starting again. Only this time she says, Don't look at me, Nana, please. Don't look at me, Nana. Three times she says it. Please don't look at me, Nana. It's at that point in telling the story that Dallas Willard pens this line. Thus, the tender soul of a little child shows us how necessary it is to us that we be unobserved in our wrong. Don't look at me, Nana. And then Ortberg follows up with this statement. Anytime we choose to do wrong or withhold doing right, we choose hiddenness as well. It may be that out of all the prayers that are ever spoken, the most common one, the quietest one, the one we least acknowledge making is simply this, don't look at me, God. It was the very first prayer spoken after the fall. God came to walk in the garden to be with the man and the woman and called, where are you? I heard you in the garden and I was afraid, Adam answered, so I hid. Don't look at me, God. That's Jacob. I, I, I wrenched away your plan for my life, took it in my own hands, and pushed through, forced through the way I thought would be best. And my mother had something to do with it. So now, please, don't look at me, God. I'm running, I'm fleeing, I'm hiding. I don't know what your week has been this week. 
I don't know if maybe you came to worship this morning thinking, don't look at me. God, don't look at me. It's been a tough week. All right, I made some wrong choices. I don't know how I'm going to get out of this because 16,000 feet is a long way down. So my question, my question for your sake and mine, my question for Jacob's sake is, so how will God respond? What does God do in that situation? So we go back this time to Genesis 28. This time we will read the full account. Genesis chapter 28, starting with verse 10. Here's what happens. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. Then Jacob made a vow saying, If God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house and of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. So he's running, fleeing, frightened. What have I done? You can picture him in your mind's eye. Perspiring, large-eyed, gasping for breath, slack-jawed, until the sun finally dips beyond the western horizon. And then he stops, finds a place, I don't know why. I picture it as a little alcove. Maybe because the language that is used there can not only imply that he took a stone that would be his pillow, but also that he took a stone that would protect him. He finds a place and collapses. It's one of those nights, no doubt. One of those nights where every move hurts, where every memory haunts, where every sound threatens. And yet finally, somehow, mercifully, sleep comes. And with sleep comes a dream. Now dreams will play a significant role later in this family. Joseph, remember? They will play a significant role in the future of this people. But this is the first one. God will and is speaking in the dream. And in the dream, Jacob sees a ladder. Can you see it? Jacob looks up and sees a ladder that glows. I want you to notice two things about this ladder that Jacob sees. 
First of all, notice where it lands, where it rests, where it's planted. It is planted on earth right next to Jacob, right there. This is Jacob, remember. Jacob, the one who doesn't deserve anything at this point in time. Jacob, who is an opportunist. Jacob, the swindler. Jacob, the liar. Rich man, poor man, beggar man, thief. This is Jacob. It has just been, I don't know, a few hours, not long, since he went into his father with with heart pounding, almost dropping the food, shaking. Since he went into him and his father, blind, asks, Is that you, my son? Is that you, Esau? And Jacob says, Yes, it is. Liar. It's been not long since he stood by his father. And his father asked, How is it that you have already returned? And Jacob says, Well, Um, God, God blessed me. Seriously? Now you're using God? Liar? Blasphemous liar? This is Jacob. Even in the conversation with God we just read, Did you notice what he said? He's still on the take, still looking for a deal, still trying to cut a bargain, still trying to make sure he gets his own. Because when God says in unconditional language, here is what I will do for you, Jacob, and lays out the magnificence of the Abrahamic promise, you know what Jacob's response is? Jacob's response is, okay, God, okay. If you'll go with me, If you'll give me food, if you make sure I have clothes, if you give me your blessing, and if you bring me back to this land, then I'll call you my God. You scoundrel. You opportunity. God has just laid it all before you, and you're trying to cut a further deal just to make sure you get it? That's Jacob lying there in the pit not deserving anything. And notice where the ladder lands. <laughs> right next to him. On earth. And I want to shake my head and wag my finger at Jacob. Accept that. I need some room beside him to slip in and we'll make room for you. So don't get judgmental. Don't get harsh because the ladder lands beside each of us on earth, in our pit. It makes me wonder if that's what the psalmist would picture in his mind's eye as he would pin centuries later Even though I make my bed in the depths, you are with me. Notice where the ladder lands. But not only notice where the ladder lands, notice where the ladder leads. Because it leads up to the very gateway of heaven. To the presence of God. That's where it leads. God? You know this God, don't you? You've read of this God in the story of Jacob's family and of Jacob's descendants. This is the God who shakes the mountain. 
This is the God who, when He shows up, the earth shakes, rattles, and rolls. This is the God who hides Himself in the vast darkness, in the lightning, in the thunder. This is the God of whom it will one day be said, He is a consuming fire. This is the God about whom Scripture writers say over and again, no one can see Him and live. This is the God whom the four living creatures in Revelation fall before and say, Holy Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. That God. And the ladder leads from Jacob in the pit to the pinnacle where God stands. I think. Because the truth is, the Hebrew there can be translated two ways. And some of your versions will underline that. It will say either that God stands at the top of the ladder and speaks to Jacob, or it will say accurately, God stands beside the ladder, beside Jacob. Maybe that's intentional, because God does both. He's the ineffable God, the transcendent God, the God of the glorious galaxies, and He's the God who joins us in the pit right beside us. Jacob and God and the latter. There will come an itinerant Galilean rabbi centuries into the future who will speak of that latter again who will say to one of his would-be disciples, you want to come after you? You'll see greater things than these. You will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on me. I am the latter. Signed, Jesus of Nazareth. That's Jacob's dream. Right at the point when he's floating around at 6,000 feet asking, what have I done? How do I get out of this? I want to read you the words of Old Testament scholar John Hartley. Writing of this moment, this experience in Jacob's life, he says, when Jacob lay down to sleep in that unknown spot, many conflicting emotions must have flooded his mind. Triumph at securing the family blessing from his virile brother. Remorse at having tricked his aging father. Relief at being out of range of Esau's anger. Apprehension about the long journey ahead to Haran. And a deep sense of loneliness for his mother. God, being aware of Jacob's troubled thoughts and his feelings of vulnerability, knew, listen to this, knew that this was not the time to condemn Jacob for his acts of trickery. Out of compassion, God appeared in order to strengthen Jacob, the bearer of the promises, for the hard years ahead. He wanted to assure Jacob that the God of his fathers was directing his way in order that the blessings entrusted to his forefathers would be fulfilled through him. How do you explain that? How do you explain a God like that? At a very moment that is primed for a lecture, what were you thinking? Seriously? 45 balloons with heat, 30 feet? What were you thinking? It's primed for that. But instead of that, God says, Jacob, I'm with you. Jacob, I'll care for you. Jacob, I'll bring you home. How do you explain that? What kind of God is this? I can't explain it, but I can tell you this. As earlier referenced, this is the kind of God who walks in the cool of the day and calls out to Adam, who is running? What have I done? Where are you, Adam? Where are you? First question in Scripture. This is the kind of God of, who is involved in the life of Jonah. God says, Jonah, I want you to go there. And Jonah says, all right, I'm going there. And the account says, and the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. 
This is the kind of God who transforms the road to Damascus into the very gateway of heaven where a man named Saul, soon to be Paul, discovers that he gazes into the very presence of God and hears God say to him, I have a plan for you. This is the kind of God depicted by the father whose younger son has taken his hard-earned money, inheritance money, and squandered it with wild living and then comes home staggering down the lane, stinking with the slime of the swine. And the father runs to embrace him. We're going to have a party. How do you explain that? But that's who this God is. It's your God. You who've had a tough week, a tough month, you've made a decision or two, you knew at the time this wasn't wise. Now you're floating around at 16,000 feet. What have I done? You didn't even want to come today. Your wife made you. Your parents made you. The whole family was going and you couldn't weasel out of it. And here you are, stuck in church with Jacob. But do you know what's remarkable? It's what Jacob says the next morning. He gets up and he says, this is unbelievable. This entire desert is out in front of me. And I ended up at the very gateway to heaven. Right here where I am. This is unbelievable. It's the same reality that's true of you. You who struggled into worship this morning. Running, hiding, don't look at me, God. Of all the seats you could have chosen in this sanctuary, you ended up in the one that is the very gateway to heaven. Right there where you're sitting. Heaven opens and the ladder lands on earth. Right next to you. And above it and beside you, God says, I'm with you. I'll care for you. I'll bring you home. That's the God of Jacob. The cheat, the opportunist, the liar, the swindler, that's his God. Who can explain that? Who can sort that out? But it's true. The story is told by the writer Donald Miller. Here are Miller's words. Last year, he writes, I pulled a friend out of his closet. His marriage was falling apart because of his inability to stop drinking. This man is a kind and brilliant human being, touched with many gifts from God, but addicted to alcohol and being taken down in the fight. He was suicidal, we thought, and the kids had been sent away. We sat together on his back deck and talked for hours deep into the night. I didn't think he was going to make it. I worried about him as I boarded my flight back to Portland and he checked himself into rehab. Two months later, he picked me up from the same airport, having gone several weeks without a drink. As he told me the story of the beginnings of his painful recovery process, he said a single incident was giving him the strength to continue. His father had flown in to attend a recovery meeting with him. And in the meeting, my friend had to confess all his issues and weaknesses. When he finished, his father stood up to address the group of addicts. He looked at his son and said, I have never loved my son as much as I do at this moment. I love him and I want all of you to know that I love him. My friend said that at that moment, for the first time in his life, he was able to believe that God loved him too. And he believed if God, his father, and his wife all loved him, 
he could fight the addiction, and he believed he just might make it. That's Jacob. Just the moment when he deserves a severe reprimand. Just the time where he's running and hiding, saying, don't look at me, God. A ladder lands beside him and leads to heaven. And God says to him, I'm with you. I'll care for you. And I'll bring you home. I don't know what decision you have made or set of decisions that have left you asking, what was I thinking? What have I done? I don't know where it is that you're hiding. But I do know this. Wherever you are, that is the gateway to heaven. Let's hunt together, church family. Higher than the mountains, and higher than the mountains that I face, stronger than the power of the grave, constant in the trial and the change. This one thing remains. This one. Thing Never runs out on me. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love. On and on. And on and on and on and on it goes. It overwhelms and satisfies my soul. And I never, ever have to be afraid. This one thing remains. This one thing remains. Cause your love never fails. runs out on me, your love. In death and life, in death, in life, I'm confident and covered by the power of your great love. My day is pain, there's nothing that can separate my heart. From your great love, cause your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love, on and on it goes. And on and on and on and on it goes. Yes, it overwhelms and satisfies my soul. And I never, ever have to be afraid. Cause 
this one thing remains this one thing remains your love never fails and never gives up and never runs out on me your love never fails and never gives up and never runs out on me your love never fails Never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love, it could be that you would like someone to pray with at the end of today's service. If that is you, just to your left and my right, across the courtyard is a prayer room where prayer volunteers would love to meet you and to pray with you. Gracious God. Your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on us. We are in awe. Not only to be reminded of that reality, but to discover that we are at the very gateway of heaven. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. good friends glad to be back with you all again and I've had wonderful phone calls other contacts from people who seem to appreciate these greetings and tell me about their family and friends so listen up 
right first on my list today. Are you watching, Barbara Wernick? Bless your heart. I'm so glad to be in your circle of friends and to also be able to greet you today for your 91st birthday. Warmest congratulations and all the best to you and your family. Gilbert Duper, right here, a part of the Loma Linda University Church family. Having a birthday, Gilbert? And I'm here to say happy birthday as I see you there with Mimi and I think a grandson, Matthew. Congratulations on your birthday. Hello, Dr. Bolton. I am so glad to be able to greet you for this special birthday. And I know you're together with family and we congratulate you on 105 years. Everybody is so grateful for who you are and what you've done recently with the paraphrase of the New Testament you have published. Congratulations. Jim Perry, what can I say? Do we have roots together, Jim? And I'm so delighted to see you from Sabbath to Sabbath in Gathering Place and other places here on campus. The best to you and precious Margaret on your birthday, Jim. Hi, Christy. So glad to be in touch with you from time to time. And Kenzie had a birthday very recently, and now you're celebrating. And I want to wish you the very best for your birthday, Christy. Hi, Jane Banta, right here at the villa. So glad to be reminded of your birthday, and I'm here to wish you the very best. Ron Rocky, over there in Alto, New Mexico. I have such great memories of visiting you there. And now to see you there with dear Nancy and to know you're marking a birthday, Ron. All the very best to you. And look at this guy and his wife. This is Mike Matthews, our oldest son and his wife, Sandy. And there they are with their number one grandchild, Mason. All the best to you, Mike. Always glad to be where you are. Sam Renzi, bless your heart, Brother Sam. Glad to know you're a part of our family here at Loma Linda University Church. Don't get to see you as much, but I know my good friends are in touch with you and they tell me you're doing well. And I congratulate you for your 91st birthday. Hello, Dennis Steerwald, over Tennessee way now, and glad to be reminded it's your birthday, Dennis, and you and Rochelle recently had an anniversary as well. Glad to be reminded, and all the best to you too. Hello, Judy Nelson, glad to see this picture of you there with your grandchildren, and so glad to know you're having another birthday, and we congratulate you. Joanne Christensen, all the way over in Trifjord at the academy there for years, I know, in Denmark. And good friends tell me you're having a birthday and I'm here to congratulate you. Hello, Randy Schell, Dr. Schell, over Louisville, Kentucky way. And a good friend gave me a call and said, please greet our friend, Randy Schell. So here I am, Randy, happy birthday, Gary Moon. Do we have history, Gary? Way back, as I recall, to our childhood years as early as Roseburg, Oregon. And now you're just about a year and a half behind me at 83. And so glad to see you there with Joan and your family. Thanks for being in touch, Joan, and all the best to all of you. Harry Parker, you and Zeonia, part of our family here in Loma Linda University Church. And now I know it's your birthday, Harry. All the very best. Wanda Ramos Patterson, you are a special part of our family and we're glad to extend our family through your children too. And there you are with Jessica. Warmest congratulations on your birthday, Wanda. Hello, Ann Burke. Part of the family right here at the villa. You're having a birthday too, I hear. Congratulations. Dee Dee Nelson. Glad you're back from Hawaii and a part of our nearby community here. And glad to see you there with Walt. Congratulations on your birthday, Dee Dee. Betsy Saunders, Claridge up College Place, Washington Way. You have a full life with your grandchildren. And so glad to see you there with Rick and wish you all the very best for your birthday. Hello, Bob Peterson. Part of our family here in Loma Linda, live out Banning Way. Glad to see you there with your wife 
and wish you all the best for your birthday. Hello, Marilyn Sykes. Glad to be reminded of your birthday. Yes, we miss dear Ivan, but we're glad to know you're having birthdays and congratulate you. Hello, Zella Floor, a part of the family here at the Villa, and I wish you all the best for your birthday as well. And that goes for all the rest of us as we look forward to another week. <laughs>